Okay. Also here, I should say, uh, because I, I worked in uh, Georgia quite a bit, and I've been to Bethesda several times, to Savannah, and to Fort Frederica, where uh, George Whitfield preached and Wesley was based, and all these are pictures around. I think it always helps uh, to have photos that give you an idea of the place. So the orphanage is there, etc. George Whitfield, preacher and evangelist. I'm thankful for the privilege of being asked to give this paper because of the richness of the material, but I'm also not thankful because of the volume of it. There are three major biographies amounting to about 1,100 pages each. The problem is what one leaves out. The life of George Whitfield was brimful of excellent work. He did not believe in wasting a second's time. He was the one who coined the phrase... I'd rather burn out than rust out. And there was not one iota of rust on him. It seems that we live in a time of thumping our heroes, but George's life was so pure in many ways, Dalimore wrote, I must confess that I've almost wished his faults had been more pronounced, lest by reason of their fewness and feebleness, I should be charged with favouritism. I can see the problem but he actually humbly confesses his own faults and frequently signs himself less than the least of all saints. His ministry has been described as seraphic. Few have been given that accolade. When he preached, literally tens of thousands would quite frequently come to hear him. Such was the attraction of his preaching. He was a superlative communicator. And the gospel, above all things in life, is supremely the vital thing to communicate. Someone has said that there are three rules to preaching. The first is communication. The second is communication. The third is communication. I think actually that's very good. It's been used with regard to prayer as well. Um, But communication is such a vital thing. Um, It matters very little if you have a mind full of theology, but you cannot hold a congregation in the palm of your hand. Whitfield consistently could do that. He had a voice of great power and sweetness of tone, a human Stradivarius. He's considered the greatest preacher that Britain has ever known, the Welsh might dissent, and point to Daniel Rowland. Daniel Rowland, of course, preached in Welsh. One of our former great preachers has called him a phenomena, which he undoubtedly was. This was a life that takes your breath away. Aren't we elevating a man here? The answer to that is no. Whitfield was nothing. He was merely an instrument made and equipped by the exceedingly gracious God for a very gracious purpose. Antonio Stradivari was a genius of a craftsman. His violins were merely his product. Whitfield himself observed, Let my name be forgotten, let me be trodden under the foot of all men, if Jesus may thereby be glorified. Let my name die everywhere, let even my friends forget me, if by that means the cause of the blessed Jesus be promoted. I want to bring souls not to a party, but to a sense of their undone condition by nature and to true faith in Jesus Christ. But what is Calvin? What is Luther? Let us look above names and parties. Let Jesus be our all in all, so that he be preached. I care not who is uppermost. I know my place, even to be the servant of all. I would not to have a people, not want to have a people called after my name. First of all, the tuning of Whitfield, take this sort of musical picture through, the tuning of Whitfield. The key to Whitfield's usefulness lies in a very deep and painful humbling. The Irish evangelist W.P. Nicholson stated that he liked his spiritual babies to be well born. By that he meant not two pound incubator babies, but ten to eleven pound whoppers that bring great pain in the birthing to their mothers. 
In this case, it was not Whitfield's mother that suffered, but of course Whitfield himself. We're talking about a very deep conviction of sin. To continue the illustration, for Whitfield it was a long and difficult labour. To put it into context, George was the son of well-to-do middle-class people who owned the Bell Inn in Gloucester, a large and fine hostelry. He was the youngest of seven, born in December 1714. Plays were put on in the largest room there, and he was involved. At school, St. Mary de Crypt, attached to the church, he was taught how to speak properly. He recalls, quote, the movings of the Blessed Spirit on my heart, unquote. It was a contradiction. He read romances, but turned from them to read the Bible. He misbehaved in church, yet played a game of church with himself as the minister. He stole from his mother and gave to the poor. He purloined books, but they were books of religion. He could read his Greek New Testament at 16 and was fluent in Latin. He would ridicule a dissenting minister by the name of Thomas Cole, running into the meeting house crying, Old Cole! Old Cole! Old Cole! This was boyish fun, but it became a matter of real conviction to him later. One of Mr. Cole's congregation asked George what he intended to do with his life. He replied, A minister, but I would take care never to tell stories in the pulpit like old Cole. Later, when preaching in Gloucester, Mr. Cole loved to come and hear him, and commented, I find that young Whitfield can now tell stories as well as old Cole. <laughs> George was school captain. It was a family tradition that the Whitfields went to Oxford, and thus it was designed for George. Without elaborating, his mother came into straitened circumstances which cast a cloud over George's future at Oxford, but they were informed of the positions of servitors, which amounted to free tuition in exchange for being the servant of three or four other students, performing menial tasks and even doing exercises for them. This was a humiliation, a form of slavery. Standards were not so hot at Oxford then. Thus George entered Oxford, matriculating November 7th, 1732. George had the benefit of a good and kind tutor who became like a father to him. He also came into contact with the Wesleys for the first time and wanted to be associated with them and the Holy Club over which John officiated. George was seeking God, but he would not find him at the Holy Club. The Wesleys were nice enough men, but in the matter of religion, they were also, quote, men of unbending self-assertion. They delighted in exercising their powers of logic and indulging in disputation. They were highly opinionated and strongly disliked being contradicted, unquote. The problem was that Though diligent in seeking God, they were not on the right path to find him, though they thought they were. The Holy Club was not evangelical. They did not have the true gospel, but a gospel of good works, which they thought would save them. They were not the beginning of revival. They had not found satisfaction, and George was soon to realise that fact. He then came into possession of a book with the title... The Life of God in the Soul of Man by Henry Skugel, which directly contradicted all that the Holy Club taught. George's conviction grew. He stated, God showed me that I must be born again or be damned. I learned that a man may go to church, say his prayers, receive the sacrament, and yet not be a Christian. How did my heart rise and shudder like a poor man that is afraid to look into his account books lest he should find himself a bankrupt? Shall I burn this book? Shall I throw it down? Or shall I search it? And holding the book in my hand, thus addressed the God of heaven and earth, Lord, if I'm not a Christian, or if I'm not a real one, for Jesus Christ's sake, show me what Christianity is that I may not be damned at last. God soon showed me, 
For in reading a few lines further that true religion is a union of the soul with God and Christ formed within us, a ray of divine light was instantaneously darted in upon my soul. And from that moment, but not till then, did I know that I must become a new creature. Yet though this was a marker to the way, that's unquote, though he, this was a marker to the way, he was still a seeker and increased bodily austerities to no avail. He was under very deep conviction now, which continued for six months with no light. He wrote, My comforts were soon withdrawn and a horrible fearfulness and dread permitted to overwhelm my soul. One morning in particular, rising from my bed, I felt an unusual impression and weight upon my breast, attended with inward darkness. In a short time I perceived this load gradually increase until it almost weighed me down and fully convinced me that Satan had as real a possession of and power given over my body as he had once over Job's. All power of meditating or even thinking, was taken from me. My whole soul was barren and dry, and I could fa fancy myself to be like nothing so much as a man locked up in iron armour. He spent whole days and weeks lying on the ground. He fasted to the point of being skeletonic, and his tutor became concerned for him. The Lord, however, was guiding him. George came to the end of all human resources. He saw that there was nothing that he could do to earn salvation. He was a pauper in debtor's prison with no way out. And at that point, God revealed himself in his grace. He cast himself on the mercy of God through Jesus Christ and testified, God was pleased to remove the heavy load to enable me to lay hold of his dear son by a living faith and by giving me the spirit of adoption to seal me even to the day of everlasting redemption. Oh, with what joy, unspeakable joy, even joy that was full of and big with glory was my soul filled when the weight of sin went off and an abiding sense of the pardoning love of God and a full assurance of faith broke in upon my disconsolate soul. Surely it was the day of my espousals. I'm sure you're aware that's wedding day. Uh, a day to be had in everlasting remembrance. At first, my, joy, my joys were like a spring tide and overflowed the banks. The problem now was that his physical strength had been greatly depleted and he was sent home to Gloucester in the providence of God to recover for nine months. However, he made good use of the time. My mind being now more open and enlarged, I began to read the Holy Scriptures upon my knees, laying aside all other books and praying over, if possible, every line and word. This proved meat indeed and drink indeed to my soul. I daily received fresh life, light and power from above. I got more true knowledge from reading the book of God in one month than I could ever have acquired from all the writings of men. He had much joy in prayer too. Oh, what sweet communion I had, had I daily with God in prayer after my coming again to Gloucester. How often have I been carried out beyond myself when sweetly meditating in the fields. How assuredly have I felt that Christ dwelt in me and I in him. And how did I daily walk in the comforts of the Holy Ghost and was edified and refreshed in the multitude of peace? Uh, he got to sleeping just three or four hours a night and to praying for the rest of the time. And that was his pattern through his life. These were blissfully happy days for Whitfield. They were days when he began to see the great truths justification by faith alone and journeyed into an understanding of the doctrines of grace growing all the time in them he enjoyed Henry's commentary for the first time and it was to be his constant companion he studied New Testament Greek Elaine's alarm to the unconverted and Baxter's call 
Neither did he waste time, but evangelized, and soon a company of young men gathered around him to form what in effect was the first Methodist society. There was also a female equivalent. It's an interesting thing, that, because you read back into those days of Whitfield, you find that he was reported to everyone to be the founder of Methodism. John Wesley said he was just uh, uh, in an associate society. It was Whitfield who was the founder of Methodism, everybody said. These, uh, where was I? Lost it. Female equivalent. He now had no other interest except the gospel as the one thing needful. There were those among the locals that wanted him to be their minister. Bishop Benson was a good man, as of Gloucester, had already heard of him and informed him that though he never ordained any young man until they were 23, and George was only 21, to come to him as soon as he was ready. George had a dread of ordination. He feared pride and falling into the snare of the devil. Nevertheless, he knew he was called and asked that if it was so, the Lord would guide by the miracle of supplying the money to return to Oxford where he needed to complete his degree. In a short space of time, he received four gifts that adequately covered the expenditure. Thus he returned, passed his degree, travelled back to Gloucester for his ordination and preached on Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Glory, glory, glory be ascribed to an almighty triune God. Last Sunday in the afternoon I preached my first sermon in St. Mary de Crypt. As I proceeded, I perceived the fire kindled till at last, though so young, and amidst a crowd who knew me in my infant days, I trust I was enabled to speak with some degree of gospel authority. Some few mocked, but most for the present seem struck. And I've since heard that a complaint has been made to the bishop that I drove 15 mad the first sermon. The worthy prelate, as I am informed, wished that the madness might not be forgotten before next Sunday. Second, the overture. Whitfield declared in 1739, I love those that thunder out the word. The Christian world is in a deep sleep. Nothing but a loud voice can wake them out of it. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones observed his first sermon in London was preached at Bishopsgate. The moment he began to preach, he attracted attention and he attracted crowds. People had never heard preaching like this. Instead of reading a most prosaic kind of essay which was supposed to do duty as a sermon, here was a man preaching with the whole of his being, with authority and power and conviction, and immediately, every time he preached, the churches were always full, were always packed. The fact is that those were days very much like Today, when the churches were empty, but now there were churches queuing up with a desire to have him to preach. He stated, the sight of the congregation was awful. One might, as it were, walk upon people's heads, and thousands went away from the largest churches for want of room. They were all attention and heard like people hearing for eternity. It's a long time since I heard that phrase. But what a great phrase. On Sunday mornings, long before day, you might see streets filled with people going to church with their lanterns in their hands and hear them conversing about the things of God. Imagine that today. This was phenomenal. The church scene seemed to have gone from death to dazzling light overnight. The word was sharper than a two-edged sword, and the doctrine of the new birth made its way like lightning into the hearer's conscience. When he returned to the place, he, the crowds came out of the city to welcome him and bless him as he passed. He preached five times a week. He was going to preach five times a day later on. Uh, men climbed to the church roof, clung to the rails of the organ loft, while the breath of the crowd within condensed into drippings on the pillars. At his farewell sermon, 
The house was loud with sobs and weepings. People were convicted. He preached simply so that the most unlearned and illiterate might understand. He preached to the common man. He used gripping illustrations. It was not what he said in preaching the gospel, but the way that he said it. He loved the people to whom he preached and invariably wept in preaching, not for effect, but out of a heart that was moved for them. Meanwhile, the Wesleys were in Savannah, Georgia, having been enlisted by General Oglethorpe to minister to the British colony over there, and they were not doing very well. They sent out an appeal to Whitfield to come over and help them. Whitfield agreed. Charles had fallen out with General Oglethorpe and returned to England early. John had alienated the people by his imperious nature. He had sought to impose their rigid, graceless system on the colony with the consequence that they lost the people. John had had an unfortunate liaison with a young lady who was waiting for him to marry her. He dragged his feet, she married another, and he banned her from the communion table in retaliation. It was a real lesson in how not to do things. George had to wait for a ship to come and in the meantime preached around Deal to great acceptance so that they wanted to retain him. He had a real battle with the pride that comes from popularity. He wrote, The tide of popularity began to run very high. In a short time, I could no longer walk on foot as usual, but I was constrained to go in a coach from place to place to avoid the hosannas of the multitude. They grew quite extravagant in their applauses, and had it not been for my compassionate high priest, popularity would have destroyed me. I used to plead with him to take me by the hand and lead me unhurt through this fiery furnace. He heard my request and gave me to see the vanity of all commendations but his own. The other side of the coin was that he was out of favour with the Church of England men. The doctrine of the new birth was irksome to them and they were jealous of his popularity. It's the same old problem of human nature that the Lord Jesus encountered with the Pharisees that were envious of him. Now to ship for Georgia. But before Whitfield's departure, John Wesley arrived in Deal. Learning that Whitfield was there, he cast a lot and sent him a message. Let him return to London. George was astonished that he should do that and replied in terms of his being responsible now, a ship's chaplain, and could not just leave. How was it that Wesley thought he had the authority over Whitfield to do such a thing? He finally sailed away on the Whitaker at the end of January 1738. There were a flotilla of ships travelling together with many soldiers aboard. At the outset, they were a godless, careless group. But such were Whitfield's personal gifts that he won them by degrees by his warm and attractive nature. He was skilled in personal evangelism. He exercised aggressive love. He even loved those that were hateful to him. Neither was there anything false about it. It was in his nature and fueled by the Holy Spirit. Such a deep and genuine love of souls. Before long, Three boats came alongside to join in worship and to hear Whitfield preach. He turned the boats into a floating chapel. A drum was beaten to summon to worship and the captain stood, one either side of him, to give him a guard of honour. It's quite an extraordinary thing that they could have been so transformed in so short a time so that they left England as heathens and arrived in America as Christians. Obviously not wholesale, but large a large proportion of them. His preaching was with melting power and his voice carried over water, which was a great sounding board. He was now preaching extemporary, whereas in his early days he read a manuscript. I think that might be true of many of us, you know, starting off in the ministry and you, 
you have to put it down. Make sure you remember everything. But then as time goes on, you don't need to put it down. Well, some of us might still, but <laughs> that's all right. Um, yeah, we have to remember that he was young, and he made a young man's mistakes, which we all make and have made. For example, he took godless books off the soldiers' bunks when they were not there, threw them into the sea, and replaced them with the Bible. <laughs> not exactly the way to do it. <laughs> He officiated at a wedding and rebuked the bridegroom for laughing during the wedding service and brought him to tears. Making oaths before God in the wedding service does not surely mean that they cease to be happy occasions. But he was full of zeal and desired the honour of God. The Georgia into which Phil landed, into which Whit Whitfield landed was, it goes without saying, a different scene than today. The population was minimal and the vegetation maximal. I think I created a new word. But it... um, no long stretching motorways, that is freeways, no small towns dotted around. It was swampland giving a proneness to fever with yellow fly and other inhospitable creatures. Nasty poisonous spiders such as black widows and brown hermit, the recluse spider, in larger numbers than today. There were rattlesnakes, diamondback, pygmy, with no lesser potency of poison. There were water moccasins that were just as happy on land and coral snakes which looked as though they were slithering around in their pajamas, but were deadlier than them all. Summer temperatures were in the hundreds daily, and the heat oppressive. Air condition had not yet been invented. In addition to that, the fact that the Church of England robes were made of wool, George and the Wesleys before him were walking around in their own personal sauna. Um, most oppressive, yet men were worse. George was received in Savannah, just as, as he had been in England. After a short time, uh, he had broken down very strong prejudices. For a start, he had a deeper understanding of human nature than the Wesleys, for he'd served in his mother's inn among all the undesirables to be found there, and viewing the needs of such people, he had come with compassion, prepared to help them in practical things. People lived in simple, primitive log cabins, uh, there, there are still those log cabins to be seen. You know, the Americans have little villages made of those old log cabins. Original log cabins, just ship them, you know. Um, so you can see them there today. Um, he distributed clothing, medicines, books, hardware, foodstuffs, bought pigs and cows for people, and thus, with a foresight not possessed by the Wesleys, he captured the hearts of the people. He broke down a very strong prejudice on the part of the magistrate. The population of Savannah was only 500 people. And there was the small community of Fort Federica, where later the Epworth Centre would be built as a Methodist retreat. Georgia at that time had only been in existence for five years. That is a colony. When Whitfield arrived and General Oglethorpe wanted the abolition of slavery, which was prominent in the community, he was met with strong opposition. Whitfield has been strongly criticised for buying slaves. He was not pro-slavery, but later wrote a letter to the slave owners to castigate them for their ill treatment of their slaves. They treated their animals better. The slave owners were not pleased with Whitfield. But even Dalimore is critical of Whitfield over his action. But I believe he was wise. There is slavery and slavery. To have made an issue of slavery would have sidetracked the work of the gospel for him. It was not that he regarded slavery as desirable, but it was so entrenched in their society that the freeing of them would take time and much dissension. The great argument in South Georgia was that the black man was able to labour in such heat. The white, not so. Um, he saved them from the abuse. Yes, sorry, lost my place again. Uh, Whitfield, in a manner of speaking, freed his slaves by purchasing them. 
He saved them from the abuse of others. He exposed them to the sound of the gospel, liberating them from the bondage of sin, a far worse slavery, and gave them much better living standards. Godly men like Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee and Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. When Jefferson died, he was in debt, and his estate, which included his slaves at Monticello, Virginia, had to be sold. They commented, we did not know we were slaves until now. There were converted slave owners who cared greatly for their black folk, taught them the gospel and how to read, etc. There was a time when 50 black folk came to Whitfield's lodgings to give thanks to God for what he'd done for their souls. They could understand Whitfield because he was simple in his ministry, a vital principle. George was the black man's first friend in America. William Seward tells the story of a young black lad who was a great mimic. He was at a drinking club. The men there asked him to mimic Whitfield, which he was unwilling to do. They insisted upon it. He stood up and he said, I speak the truth in Christ. I lie not. Except you repent, you will all be damned. This unexpected speech broke up the club, which never met again after that. <laughs> Whitfield had reversed the situation in Georgia, had ministered lovingly to the people, been the means of the conversion of a good number of souls, had a personal witness to the Indian chief of the area, and was moved to establish an orphanage on his next visit, for there were many orphans of those settlers who had died in the climate. He'd arrived on May 7th, 1738, and he departed 28th August of the same year, a stay of three months, three weeks. Oh, what he had achieved in that time. They sent him off with real expressions of love and appreciation. Quote, they came to me from the morning to the time I left them with tears in their eyes, wishing me a prosperous voyage and safe return, and gave me other tokens of their love, for they brought me wine, ale, cake, coffee, tea, and other things proper for my passage, and their love seemed without dissimulation. My heart was full, and I took the first opportunity of venting it by prayers and tears. I think I never parted from a place with more regret. For America, in my opinion, is an excellent school to learn Christ in. Third, the ambush movement. Which will experience quite different scenes on his return to his native shores, such that it could be wondered if he would ever make it. The seas were wild and in turmoil, rather like those that Paul encountered in the Mediterranean and Jonah before him. We might also mention recent storms at sea, which pounded and smashed concrete and railway lines. It had George thinking of death, but he knew it to be satanic attack. Supplies were soaked, and passengers too, being unable to escape, the powerful fingers of the sea which seemed to reach into every cabin with the resultant assault and mugging. There was little opportunity for ministry on board. On shore, George found the churches now closed to him, and very few Anglican men open to his ministry. Nevertheless, he was ordained to the priesthood of the Church of England by good old Bishop Benson on January the 14th, 1739 and also made minister of Savannah by the trustees of the orphanage. Providence was guiding him to open-air ministry. No self-respecting Anglican would be found even considering it, not knowing the gospel anyway. Thus were two basic factors through which the Lord pointed George, George in this direction. The hostility of the clergy and the fact that the churches could not contain the vast crowds that came to hear him for their soul's sake, listening for eternity. J.C. Ryle wrote, The clergy, with a few honourable exceptions, refused entirely to countenance this strange preacher. In the true spirit of the dog in the manger, they neither liked to go after the semi-heathen masses of population themselves, nor liked anyone else to do the work for them. The plain truth is, the Church of England that day was not ready 
for a man like Whitfield. The church was too much asleep to understand him and was vexed at a man who would not keep still and let the devil alone. Unquote. Whitfield could say, the churches are closed against me, but bless God, the fields are open. Pamphlets were published against him to which he did not reply. Great advertising. Opposition was growing. Even good old Bishop Benson, who had been responsible for ordaining him, had exclaimed to the Count and Countess of Huntingdon that he wished he'd never done so. To which the Countess had replied, My Lord, mark my words, when you're on your dying bed, that will be one of the few ordinations you will reflect upon with pleasure. She was right. When he was near death, he sent Whitfield ten guineas with a request for him to pray for him. A number of Anglican bishops had expressed concern over the state of the times. Bishop Warburton observed, I have lived to see that fatal crisis when religion has lost its hold on the minds of the people. Bishop Butler wrote, it is come, I know not how, to be taken for granted by many persons that Christianity is not so much as a subject of inquiry, but that it is now at length discovered to be fictitious. Bishop of Norwich gave an overview of our country. Wickedness still overflows the nation like a mighty deluge, so as to overspread all ranks and orders of men amongst us. Do not our eyes behold it continually in the open atheism, profaneness and impiety, in the hypocrisy and dissimulation, in the contempt of God and his holy worship, in the profanation of his holy day, in the bold infidelity and denying the Lord that bought us. In the dreadful abuse of God's great and glorious name, by the horrid oaths, curses and imprecations which are heard continually in our streets and in the places of concourse and conversation. In the practice of the most filthy and abominable lusts, in the lewdness and luxury, in the oppression and injustice, in the implacable malice and hatred of one towards another, and in our senseless divisions and animosities, without cause, and without end, which reigns everywhere. Unquote. This could be a description of our own land at this time. Whitfield was not the first one to think of open air preaching, nor the first to attempt it, but he was the first great field preacher. Howell Harris, who was to be a close friend in the future, preached or should we say exhorted because he'd been refused ordination in the open air in Wales. Also, Richard Morgan was the first to preach at Kingswood near Bristol in 1738. Whit Whitfield simply noted it with interest. It was a mining area and there were literally thousands of miners there who laboured in deplorable conditions were a sullen, sad race, given to bursts of violence, running into Bristol, pillaging and terrorising the town. George, having with some friends invited the miners to hear the gospel, took his stand on a mount at Rose Green there, on the common, and began to preach. His congregation amounted to a couple of hundred. He announced that he would be back there the following Wednesday. Nearly 2,000 turned up the second time. In future visits that grew to four or 5,000, then to 10,000. That's a classic report of the scenes. I'm sure you know this quote very well. Having no righteousness of their own to renounce, they were glad to hear of a Jesus who was a friend of publicans and came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. The first discovery of their being affected was to see the white gutters made by their tears, which plentifully fell down their black cheeks as they came out of their coal pits. Hundreds and hundreds of them were soon brought under deep convictions, which, as the event proved, happily ended in a sound and thorough conversion. Unquote. The Kingswood work grew further as it progressed, 
with 40 to 50,000 estimated congregation in 30 meetings a week. George was now planning to return to America, but needed someone to oversee the work for him in his absence. He thought of friends like Hutchins and Kinchin, and then of Hal Harris, but he had all his work in Wales. Whitfield had gone there to aid him, and within four years, the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist work was formed. During his absence in America, both Wesleys had been converted, though the exact time for John could not be verified. He experienced his heart being strangely warmed in a meeting at Fetters Lane, which became a Moravian church, believing in justification by faith alone, but having no clear theology apart from that. John remained unclear as to his being truly a Christian for some months. He stated, I am not a Christian. And assurance of faith only came with success in open-air preaching. It is seen that John Wesley was not Whitfield's first choice to oversee his work. He finally came to write such an invitation under pressure of someone needing someone as time to leave was fast approaching and the irony is that his letter crossed a letter from Wesley in the post rebuking him for accepting the financial help of, wealthy, of William Seward, a wealthy convert who desired to help the orphanage without first securing the permission of the Fetters Lane Society. But George had never recognised their rules or joined them. He replied, I thank you most heartily for your kind rebuke. I can only say it was too tender. I beseech you, whenever you see me do wrong, rebuke me sharply. I have still a word or two to offer in my defence, in defence of my behaviour, but shall defer it till I come to town. It has to be said that John Wesley was rather partial to rebuking. John Wesley overcame his res reservations as to the ecclesiastical propriety of preaching on unconsecrated ground, grew in confidence, and Whitfield urged him to preach not only there, but at Moorfields, where he also began to preach. Such is the pressure on time in this. I haven't even touched Moorfield, but I hope you know something about that. That was another great open-air uh, conquest before he left for Georgia. In fact, George championed Wesley, encouraged him, and recommended him, recommended him to preach elsewhere. Whether he should have done might be said to be an imponderable. As to whether he was ready for such a thing, if Whitfield had not put Wesley forward, would the controversy that blighted the 18th century revival have taken place? Maybe, if he had not so encouraged Wesley to this work, would not the Lord have brought help from another quarter? Examining Wesley's subsequent behaviour, was Whitfield laying hands on a novice? John was George's senior by 11 years, but not spiritually. George was now very experienced in the work of the Gospel. There were only 11 weeks between John's uncertainty in the faith and his taking up the open air work. So what happened? This is a matter that one would rather not mention were it not for the fact that it had a dynamic effect on the 18th century revival and it is best, therefore, just to give the facts. John Wesley began to have serious, though not fundamental, departures in doctrine. He did not believe in election, and he developed the doctrine of complete sanctification, which was never clear in his own mind. Whitfield began to be aware of this before he departed on his second visit to America. He warned him not to speak against election, as many people love that doctrine. He would be dividing the body of Christ. He would also be abusing the trust that George Whitfield had placed in him, though Whitfield did not tell him that. Such was the character of Wesley. I think that was an invitation to him to do just what he did. What did he do? Once Whitfield had crossed the Atlantic, John Wesley cast a lot to justify himself, and the lot came up, preach and print. 
His language was strong. Read predestination. Quote. It is a doctrine full of blasphemy, of such blasphemy as I should dread to mention, but that the honour of our gracious God and the cause of truth will not suffer me to be silent. In the cause of God then, and from a sincere concern for the glory of his great name, I will mention a few of the horrible blasphemies contained in this horrible decree. This doctrine represents our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous, the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth, as a hypocrite, a deceiver of the people, a man void of common sincerity. Such blasphemy this, as one would think might make the ears of a Christian tingle. But there's yet more behind. For just as it honours the Son, so does this doctrine honour the Father. It destroys all his attributes at once. It overturns both his justice, mercy and truth. Yea, it represents the most holy God as worse than the devil, as both more false, more cruel and more unjust. Just to pause that, it seems to me that there is justification by works slinking around in a cloak in the background here. This is the blasphemy going on, contained in the horrible decree of predestination. And here I fix my foot. On this I join issue on every asserter of it. You represent God as worse than the devil, more false, more cruel, more unjust, etc. John Wesley preached it in George Whitfield's pulpit in Bristol. Isn't that the work of a novice, don't you think? There's etiquette, isn't there? He also had it sent throughout the land. He hijacked the work, took over Whitfield's property purchased by Whitfield's people, put John Kennick out of the church because he believed in predestination, though Kennick was not a troublemaker. He warned the people not to listen to Whitfield on his return so that George's own converts passed him by in the street with their fingers in their ears. George Whitfield was deeply grieved by all this, not on his own account. Wesley wrote to draw Whitfield into controversy, but George did not take the bait, save to say that John Wesley had achieved the vision he desired. George came to see that he had to correct the errors, and when he returned to England he had the paper against Whit Wesley's teaching published. It was a clear defence... But nothing had any effect on John Wesley. He was not open to reason. He did not like being contradicted. When George Whitfield went on preaching tours after his return, John and Charles Wesley went behind him preaching against him. His work in England had suffered such a reversal that he was left in a serious financial condition with the debt for the orphanage that he was in danger of debtor's prison. This was the result of Wesley's work when Whitfield had shown nothing but kindness to him. This fairly takes the breath away. If we had any sense of justice, how do you explain such a thing? To understand this, you have to look into the Wesley's roots and background. His father Samuel was a minister at Epworth in Lincolnshire. He actually earned a salary far above the normal, but spent his time in serious debt. Whoever was wrong, it was not Samuel. When his wife refused to toast the king, Samuel said that he would not live with her for undermining his authority. He supported his sons, but his daughters and wife had to scratch for crusts. His daughter Hetty was a very gifted poet. It's the view of some that she was superior to Charles, and we know how good Charles was, don't we? She fell in love with a man who swore faithfulness, but left her pregnant and heartbroken. Though she was truly repentant, Samuel never forgave her and forced her to marry a worthless man. Samuel gave her no love and ruined her life. His brother reasoned with him, but Samuel was never wrong in his own eyes. He abused his own parishioners by the heaviest of heavy shepherding. I'm sure that term could have been around in uh, those days of uh, Samuel Wesley at Epworth. Uh, by having them do penance by going barefoot on the stone floor of the church wearing a nightshirt. He was imperious. You can understand that the children were closer to their mother and she was a strict disciplinarian. This is a terribly sad story. John had many of his father's traits. George Whitfield sought reconciliation 
but it took years. He was most meek and loving. His followers thought him too kind to Wesley. That gentleman also tried to take over the Moravians but failed. He could have had Adonijah as a second name. I will be king. There was this trait of always being boss. We may, we may all have a touch of Wesleyitis in our character. Fourth, the Golden Movement. In October 1739, George was on the ocean again on his way to America. And what lay ahead was that which has been called the Great Awakening. He did much writing on the boat and penned the following. Oh, for a revival of true and undefiled religion in all sects whatsoever. God make me an instrument of promoting it. And thinks I care not what I do or suffer so that I might see my Lord's kingdom come with power. The whole world is now my parish. Wheresoever my master calls me, I am ready to go and preach his everlasting gospel. My only grief is that I can do no more for Christ. Unquote. But this voyage was one of great agony for Whitfield. It might be that it was preparation for being greatly used. He writes, The searcher of hearts alone knows what agonies my poor soul had un has undergone since my retirement from the world. I groan daily. Dearest Redeemer, I come to thee weary and heavy laden. The Lord has been pleased to withdraw from me and to permit, permit Satan to send me a thorn in the flesh. Had I not known that my Redeemer lives, I must have sunk in despair. Sometimes, like Elijah, I wish for death. Unquote. The Lord may use the devil in our sanctification. This is his prerogative, but not a pleasant experience. Whitfield underwent a torrid time. He further wrote, The sense of my actual sins and natural deformity humbled me exceedingly. And then the freeness and riches of God's everlasting love broke in with such light and power upon my soul that I was often awed into silence and could not speak. I underwent inexpressible agonies of soul for two or three days. This latter part of the week, blessed be the Lord, he has restored me to the light of his countenance and enabled me to praise him with joyful lips. Unquote. He was brought into a deeper experimental understanding of the doctrines of grace, not merely of the mind, but deeply in the heart, a vital thing for the servant of God. It is a pity that there's not more time to quote these things, for there is sublimity in his writing. Nothing, he says, could possibly support my soul and of the many agonies which oppress me when on board, but a consideration of the freeness, eternity, and unchangeableness of God's love to me. I need not fear the sight of sin when I have a perfect, everlasting righteousness wrought out for me by Jesus Christ. The riches of his free grace cause me daily to triumph over all the temptations of the wicked one. Unquote. One is granted a peep into the burning soul of Whitfield. He wrote to Harris concerning his hearers. Put them in mind of the freeness and eternity of God's electing love and be instant with them to lay hold of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. Talk to them, oh, talk to them, even till midnight of the riches of his all-sufficient grace. Tell them, oh, tell them what he has done for their souls and how earnestly he is now interceding for them in heaven.
Show them in the map of the word the kingdoms of the upper world and the transcendent glories of them and assure them that all shall be theirs if they believe on Jesus Christ with their whole hearts. Press them to believe on him immediately. Intersperse prayers with your exhortations and thereby call down fire from heaven, even the fire of the Holy Ghost, to soften, sweeten and refine and melt them into love. Speak every time, my dear brother, as if it was your last. Weep out, if possible, every argument, and as it were, compel them to cry, Behold how he loves us. Remember me. Remember me in your prayers. Unquote. That's sublime. God give us a love for souls like that. Whitfield had two great burdens on board, and in the days following, first, sorry, and in the days following, first that of the Wesley problem, which had not burst out yet. In other words, what I did was I gave you the whole picture, and Whitfield went to America in the middle of it, as it were, and he came back to the worst part. Uh, But the fear of it, and of division, filled him. He was concerned for the glory of God. The second was the whole matter of marriage. It seems that George had fallen in love with Elizabeth Delamotte. And it was equally possible that she'd fallen for him. He'd been the guest of her parents at their mansion in Bexley, down the way. They had all been converted. He'd been wrestling with the whole matter, marriage that is. His problems were that he did not want any other love to displace his love for Christ or the work of his gospel, yet he now felt the need for a helpmeet. Do you understand the dilemma and the struggle within him? During this trip, he wrote to her parents asking for her hand and then also to her. Among the things he wrote to them in asking for their daughter were, quote, You need not be afraid of sending me a refusal. For I bless God if I know anything of my own heart, I am free from that foolish passion which the world calls love. (laughs) I write only because I believe it is the will of God that I should alter my state. But your denial would fully convince me that your daughter is not the person appointed by God for me. He knows my heart, I would not marry but for him, etc. Unquote. He mentioned at the outset of the letter the young ladies that had died in coming to America. George then wrote to her, speaking of all the hardships that life in America would bring. You could not imagine letters better designed to bring a refusal. Her parents were not keen. She married someone else. A couple of years later, he was in another situation which was quite bizarre. Something pulls your eyebrows back. His friend, Hal Harris, was deeply in love with the widow, Elizabeth James, and she with him. He felt the same way as Whitfield concerning marriage negatively affecting his ministry, and though his heart ached, asked if Whitfield might take her on. Maybe that's an unfortunate way of putting it. (laughs) She was ten years older than he. They came together to talk about it, the three of them. Whitfield liked her. Elizabeth must have felt like a Welsh lamb being bartered between two farmers, though very nice and godly ones. The lamb was rather bewildered, but recognised the honour of being the wife of such a great servant of God. Whitfield decided he would have her. She understandably wanted time to decide. She accepted, and they were married. Despite what some biographers have said, it was a happy marriage. She did travel with Whitfield at the outset, and was an aide to him. He had a true affection for her. She bore him a son, whom Whitfield named John, with the thought of John the Baptist, stated that he believed through an impression that John would be a great preacher of the gospel. A few months later, the baby died. That was devastating. There followed a string of stillborn babies, which would have been very distressing and wearing to the poor lady. She was of fine spiritual quality, and they did have a happy marriage. He built a house for her next to his tabernacle in London. She died about three years before him. One must not imagine the America of those days to be anything like that of today with regard to size. 
The populations of Boston, New York, Philadelphia were from 12,000 to 14,000. Considering they were the big cities, everything else was smaller. Whitfield's associations had changed. It was not denominational adherence now, but evangelical soundness. But it was, his was criteria for ministry. He preached for the Dutch Reformed Church, the Presbyterian, and the Baptist. America was no stranger to revival. There had been a movement of the Holy Spirit on the ministry of Jonathan Edwards in Northampton in 1735, not to mention others before him. There was the work of the Log College established under William Tennant, who excuse me, gathered young men around him and taught them to send them out. His sons were among them, John, who died young after a two-year ministry which was full of blessing, fruitfulness, such as men have not known in a 40-year ministry. William Junior, Junior, another remarkable ministry, and Gilbert, who was a plain-speaking firecracker, whose ministry Whitfield greatly admired and who became a close friend. Jonathan Edwards invited him to preach in Northampton, and not being known for tears, wept through the entire message, we're informed. Sarah Edwards wrote to her brother, Dear Brother James, I want to prepare you for a visit from the Reverend Mr. Whitfield, the famous preacher of England. He's been sojourning with us. He is truly a remarkable man, and during his visit has, I think, verified all we've heard of him. He makes less of the doctrines than our American preachers generally do, and aims more at affecting the heart. He is a born orator. You've already heard of his deep toned yet clear and melodious voice. It is perfect music. It is wonderful to see what a spell he casts over an audience by proclaiming the simplest truths of the Bible. I've seen upwards of a thousand people hang on his words with breathless silence, broken only by an occasional half-suppressed sob. He impresses the ignorant and not less the educated and refined. He's a very devout and godly man, and his only aim seems to be to reach and influence men the best way. He speaks from a heart aglow with love and pours out a torrent of eloquence which is almost irresistible. Unquote. One of the most remarkable facts of Whitfield's visits to America was the fact that he became a close friend of Benjamin Franklin. Politician signed the... Uh, a document of independence, uh, inventor, etc., printer, who admired his oratory immensely, actually measured the distance from which he could be heard, heard him frequently, had him stay at his home, was moved to give to the orphanage, though determined at the outset not to, finished up emptying his pockets of brass, then silver, then gold coins, published his sermons and journal, but resisted all attempts to bring him to Christ to the very end of Whitfield's life. That isn't a comment on spiritual death. I don't know what is. And the fact that it's only the grace of God that saves. Poor Benjamin Franklin finished up a bigamist with one family in America and another in France. Whitfield's trials, both in England and America, were many, some of them very sadly in the name of religion. In Charleston, there was a commissary called Alexander Garden, that garden was full of weeds, who used extreme language and means, coordinating an ecclesiastical court to disrobe Whitfield, sending an appeal to that end to London, but they treated it there as a joke. In Scotland, perhaps one of the saddest was from the new associate presbytery of the Presbyterian Church, headed by the Erskine brothers, who were both good men but wanted Whitfield to join them and to preach for them alone. He asked, why only for them? Mr. Ralph Erskine said they were the Lord's people. I then asked were there, were there, whether there were no other Lord's people but themselves. And supposing that all others were the devil's people, they certainly had more need to be preached to, and therefore I was more and more determined to go out into the highways and hedges, and that if the Pope himself would lend me his pulpit, I would gladly proclaim the righteousness of Christ therein. The company broke up and went into the church where one preached on, Watchmen, what of the night? 
Whitfield was there, the good man preached against prelacy, the common prayer book, the surplus, the rose in the hat, with such heat that when it came to the latter part of the text, inviting poor sinners to Jesus Christ, he had no voice left. What a pity, said Whitfield, that, that the last was not first and the first last. Whitfield was called a servant of the devil by some and other choice phrases. Legalism and Pharisaism are among the most killing things spiritually to the people of God, for they repel rather than attract. George certainly made errors of judgment, more in the heat of youth, but was very much humbled at the thought of that, and publicly apologised. He frequently, in his early days, spoke in, both in England and America against the dangers of an unconverted ministry. In my former journal, he says, taking things by hearsay too much, I spoke and wrote rashly of the colleges and ministers of New England, for which, as I've already done it, when at Boston, last from the pulpit, I take this opportunity of asking the public pardon from the press. It was rash and uncharitable, and though well meant, I feared it hurt. Whitfield had a tender conscience, a most valuable asset. He also saw the danger of being led by impressions since the death of his first son and never followed them again. Finally, the great crescendo. At a place called Fag's Manor, Whitfield recorded, the congregation was about as large as that at Nottingham. As great, if not a greater commotion, was in the hearts of the people. Most were drowned in tears. The word was sharper than a two-edged sword. The bitter cries and groans were enough to pierce the hardest heart. Some of the people were as pale as death. Others were wringing their hands. Others lying on the ground. Others sinking into the arms of friends. And most lifting up their eyes to heaven and crying to God for mercy. They seemed like persons awakened by the last trump and coming out of their graves to judgment. Unquote. George Whitfield did not spare himself. From his mid-twenties his health began to break down. It was at that age that asthma first appeared. On arriving in America for one visit he was so ill that he could have died. And he had one person saying, be gone. Sickness did not stop him preaching. Neither did exhaustion. One biographer has said that he was often fatigued beyond endurance, but the sight of his congregation, the delight he had in his work, and the strength which comes from above, quickened him to speak with freedom and power. That is how it was at the last, in his last visit to America in 1770. In the month of September, he came to Exeter after having completed a 180-mile preaching tour. He had not planned to preach, but they directed a platform in order he should do so. An elderly man said to him, Sir, you are more fit to go to bed than to preach. He agreed, but he said, Lord Jesus, I am weary in the work, but not of your work. If I have not yet finished my course, let me go and speak for you once more in the fields, seal your truth and come home and die. He was unable to speak for several minutes and then said, I will wait for the gracious assistance of God, for he will, I am certain, assist me once more to speak in his name. He then preached what is thought one of his best messages for a matter of two hours. Among his last words were these, I go, I go to a rest prepared. My son has arisen and by aid from heaven has given light to many. It is now about to set. No, it is about to rise to the zenith of immortal glory. Many may outlive me on earth, but they cannot outlive me in heaven. O oh, thought divine! I shall soon be in a world where time, age, pain and sorrow are unknown. My body fails, my spirit expands. How willingly would I live to preach Christ, but I die to be with him. He was staying with his old friend Jonathan Parsons, the pastor of the old South Presbyterian Church, Newburyport, Massachusetts. And when on his way up the stairs to bed, there were those who'd followed and pleaded with him to preach once more to them. 
He did so and lost sense of time preaching until the candle went out. He went to bed, experienced an asthmatic attack. There are some who now think it was emphysema and ascended to glory at 6 a.m. on the 30th, that is of September. It was death by preaching, without a doubt. He was buried under the pulpit and his mortal remains are still there. Jonathan Parsons preached his funeral sermon in America and John Wesley his memorial service in England. Whitfield had requested it and Wesley spoke to Whitfield's honour, giving the glory to God. Dr. Lloyd-Jones once said that if you think you've had a good day in the pulpit and are in danger of being full of it, go and read Whitfield. Boy, he's right. We must emulate him in preaching. Study simplicity. Have a picture in our minds of the judgment day. Have a burning love in our hearts for the souls in front of us. And be motivated by the love of Christ. We must maintain a sweet spirit. No matter the injustice and unkindness we might suffer from the hands of men. We must avoid party spirit. I am of Paul. I am of Cephas. I am of Apollos. Whitfield gave up all to Wesley in the end. He did not wish his name to be given to a party, but that Christ should be all in all. An old preacher once spoke of the romance of preaching. You never know what's going to happen. Boy, that's true. Sometimes what you wanted to happen didn't happen. <laughs> but, you know, that's the romance of preaching. Do we get our messages on our knees, as Whitfield did? Who is in control of our preaching? Is it the Holy Spirit or us? The Lord help us that every word comes from his mercy seat. And that is the paper.